I'm, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm really excited to present on this. Hope has always been something that I've been really uh, intrigued by and curious about. It's one of those, well, it felt to me to be very mysterious and um, something that I couldn't quite put my fingers on. So I was excited to be able to dig a little bit deeper and find some more information. And we're just going to take a look at that tonight. And you can make your own decisions. There's a couple different ideas out there around what hope is um, and how we can invite more hope in to our lives. So I'll share that with you and then you can take it and experiment with it in your life. So the first definition from my trusty Wikipedia source says that hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. It's a pretty big definition. Um, you know, another way of thinking about this is hope is our response to the belief that the future will be better than this moment. Okay, and I think we've all either experienced that or wanted to experience that. That what I'm living right now doesn't have to be my future, that things can change. There's really two ways to look at the future. We can either look at the future with fear or with hope. And my argument tonight is going to be to embrace hope. Norman Vincent Peale said that hope is wanting something so eagerly that in spite of all the evidence that you're not going to get it, you go right on wanting it. And the remarkable thing about it is that this very act of hoping produces a strength of its own. I'm wondering if any of you can think about a time when, you know, despite everything uh, that you are feeling, seeing, people are telling you, you just keep on wanting. You want, you want something different. I often use the example in my own life uh, when I talk about hope, um, that there was, when I went to meet with my high school guidance counselor, and there was no evidence <laughs> to support me going to university, which she very clearly shared with me. She said, you know, you're not going to get to university. You better think of something else to do. And so there wasn't, you know, she was right. The evidence didn't support me going. And yet that was something that I wanted and was just, I knew that would happen. And I think, I think that act of me hoping and staying true to that belief produced a strength that, lo and behold, I did get to university. Thank you to my guidance counselor. Maybe I needed that push. Hope is a strong antidote for trauma, and it's actually one of the five core elements of resilience. Uh, the other four being self-knowledge and insight, healthy coping, strong relationships, as well as personal perspective and meaning. So to be resilient, to bounce back in the face of struggle, we do need to have hope. Any of you that know me know that you will never have a webinar from me without Brene Brown in it. And so she shares this idea that we hold on to pessimism because it's safe. But to hold on to hope and joy and love, that takes courage. It really is a, an act of courage. And Safety? Yeah, I would rather be safe. Who doesn't want to be? And yet, when we choose courage over comfort, some amazing things happen. Remember, the magic happens in the mess. We have to be, we have to go through the stormy bits. And that's going to be hope, joy, and love. Stay here for a couple minutes. Because To, get cur to be courageous, 
and to stay and hold on to hope, joy, and love, what is that going to be? That's going to be a vulnerable process, right? And if you remember from my earlier um, webinars and anyone that's been to Bridgepoint and has heard me talk about vulnerability, there's three things that make up vulnerability. Vulnerability is risk, it's uncertainty, and it's emotional exposure. So if we think about hope and joy and love, but for this webinar, hope, yeah, having hope is a risk because we don't have control over everything. There's some uncertainty. What if I hope for this? What if I, what if I want this and it doesn't happen? And it's emotional exposure. Because to allow ourselves to hope then there is also the vulnerability that I will be discouraged, let down, afraid of what it, if it doesn't happen. So hope is definitely an act of courage. Now some of those earlier definitions sounded like they were more, hope was more an emotional state. Now there's a professor from the university, um, from the state, C.S. Snyder. And he talks about hope as not an emotion, but rather a way of thinking or a cognitive process. So his definition is hope is a positive motivational state that is based on an interactively derived sense of successful agency, pathways, and goals. So let's break that down. So in Snyder's theory of hope, we need to be setting some goals, obviously smart goals, goals that are achievable, but maybe take us out of our comfort zone, but they're definitely achievable. And then we need the pathways. We need to figure out how, what are the, how can I cultivate the direction and the pathway that will achieve that goal? And we need agency. And what agency means is, I believe I can do it. So two of the prerequisites for hope in this, in Snyder's theory of hope, is perseverance and tenacity. Because there are going to be barriers that come up. But if these are the three things that create hope, then hope is teachable and hope is measurable. And hope is no longer a product of not, of, of, of failing, okay? So hope, actually, those with the strongest hope are those who have had the most experiences of failure. Again, if we go back to that idea that hope is a function of courage, when, we, when we're courageous, yes, we are going to fail. But actually, the idea of it being a failure, the minute we learn from it, it's no longer a failure. It's just a teachable moment, right? And so the challenge is to have not see hope as a product we're tying it to our tying it to who we are. Okay. Now, if we take this theory and then we think about it in its role in our recovery, recovery from eating disorders, recovery from process addictions, recovery from um, 
unhealthy ways of doing things. This is a model of the role of hope in recovery that uh, was created by Hobbs and Baker. So when we look at hope in our recovery, we're going to need to have the influence of others, our personal hope, and then doing recovery. These are kind of the three um, main components that are going to be necessary. So let's break them down. If you look at influence of others, um, when, when Hobbs and Baker were doing their research, most, most of the people that were mentioned were either family and friends, people with similar difficulties, and clinicians. So this was who the research, research participants mentioned most often. So those positive models of recovery were the people with similar difficulties. They may be met in person, they may be met um, over the internet, even uh, seeing famous people, but these people were able to provide a positive narrative or a positive story about recovery, which, um, which was inspiring to those wanting to do recovery, wanting to do something different. Others believing in recovery, this was often the clinicians, and so this was where um, it became really important to find people and work with people and have people on your team that do believe in recovery. In this research, and probably all of you have experienced it, how different it is for people to have a positive prognosis for us for recovery, that it is possible, that yes, we can change, you can learn new things and do things differently, and is it going to be hard? Yes, but it is possible, and to have people believe in us, I don't know about you, but for me, even not in recovery, but in general life, when I know people believe in me, I have reached new heights and done things I didn't think I would be able to do before, or I didn't feel inspired to do them really important to have other people believing in recovery and believing in us. The interpersonal links is really that sense of connectedness. So whether it be your faith community, your support groups, um, sometimes with interpersonal links, this was where people in the research spoke to, you know, I feel like I, I want to do recovery for my daughter, my son, my partner. Um, I feel responsible for these other loved ones. Or I want to do recovery because I want to help others. And remember, we're hardwired for connection. We need it. And we can't do recovery alone. You're the one that's going to do the work, but you need, you need your positive people around you. And so this interpersonal, these interpersonal links are those, those connections that you build. All of these, we have an active role in because we can seek this out. We can seek out positive models of recovery. We can seek out those narratives that say, yes, have hope. Recovery is possible. You can change your relationship with weight, shape, food, your body. There are books and podcasts and celebrities that are speaking up and saying, hey, I also struggled with disordered eating. and..." I'm in a different place now. I've changed that. We all need to have someone that believes in us. So find that clinician, find that doctor, find that psychiatrist that is going to work with you, that believes in you and believes in recovery and make those connections. Now you'll see on the screen, there's an arrow going between positive models and hope. Because definitely hearing these stories of, of success and stories of overcoming obstacles, overcoming an eating disorder, really inspired and helped these research participants have hope, believe recovery is possible. And again, also others believing in recovery helped us believe in ourselves that recovery was possible. The middle component, personal hope. 
Catalyst to Hope, this was where people talked about a turning point, a significant moment, a change in perspective. Okay. And for some people, this was a huge event or what, is, what would have um, seemed like a, something dramatic, traumatic, um, whether it be a near life or near death experience, whether it be uh, something catastrophic happening. For other people, it doesn't have to be those big uh, events. It can be something small, intimate, a gesture that happened, um, an exception to what you were expecting, and it, and it sparks something in us. And that also led to these participants believing recovery is possible for themselves. Now, the maintaining hope piece was, how do I maintain this hope that I have now? And how do I keep this? A lot of people talk about the momentum. So when people come to Bridgepoint, how do I keep this momentum going once I leave? This is the maintaining hope piece. And when I think about this personal hope, and I think about C.S. Snyder's theory of hope, here's where we're going to find the goals. We're going to set goals out of something happens. So a catalyst is going to happen that has us wanting to change. And we start believing in ourselves. So we find agency. We could also put goals down in maintaining hope because I set new goals and new goals and that helps maintain that momentum. I maintain the uh, structure that I set up while I was at Bridgepoint. I keep using my journal or I set up a CE space to continue exploring that avenue. Okay, so those goals become part of the personal hope. The pathways, how do we Cultivate the pathways to find those goals. That's in the doing the recovery. So first of all, we've gained an understanding. So before we can make change, often because of something happening, the catalyst, we have a new understanding. Or we go out now and seek out new knowledge, new information. And then we decide to make change. But any of you that have been in this process before know this is slow and long. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It fluctuates over time and it is not linear. Who of us wouldn't like it to, to go from point A to point B? But it doesn't happen that way. It is a bit of a roller coaster, lots of ups and downs. Uh, and again, we hone our skills we hone our tenacity, we hone our goals, we clarify them during those stormy, stormy times. So one thing to consider is that recovery is not a finite destination. Okay, so um, when we're thinking about maintaining recovery and hope, do we get to a final destination and say, ah, there we go, that's it, I'm done? Or do we continually find hope, cultivate hope, reset our goals, reset our commitment to believing that recovery is possible? We recommit to our interpersonal links and connections. We continue to find positive role models, and then that helps recovery maintenance over time. The pretty in like there's a lot of pieces to this, but when we break it down, the exciting thing is that it's teachable. This isn't some elusive, far off. Either you have it when you were born or you don't. We all have. The capacity to build hope into our life. For some, it's going to come easier than for others. 
And it's difficult when we have been told stories and continue to be around those that tell stories and continually tell ourselves the story that why hope? Why hope? Because then it's just going to be taken away from me. Why hope? Because it's not possible. Those stories are destructive. And so again, we actively have to go out and find those people that believe in recovery, that have done it. We need to have connection while we're on this journey. We need to create goals. All of this becomes tangible and within our ability to do, if that makes sense. So what supports hope? Well, we've been talking about people. Finding those people that inspire you because they've been through something similar or even different, but they have just overcome obstacles and succeeded in making change or leveling up and going to uh, into, to doing something they didn't think possible, you didn't think possible. What supports hope is having a vision. So again, whether that is someone finding your hope in someone else's journey, but also creating your own vision. So some people will have heard this question before, but there is a, uh, in solution-focused therapy, there is a question that's often asked, and it's called the Miracle Day question. So I'm gonna ask it to you right now. So pretend you go home tonight, and you get ready for bed, you do all your evening ablutions, and you get into your pajamas, brush your teeth, wash your face, do all those things that you would normally do, and then jump into bed, pull up the covers, and you go to sleep. And while you're asleep, a miracle happens. And everything that you want different, everything that brought you to Bridgepoint, everything that brought you to your counselor, your psychiatrist, is no longer an issue. It's done, it's gone. But you didn't know that because you were sleeping. So you wake up in the morning, and the question is, what is different? What are you doing differently? What are you feeling different? What are you saying different? What are other people noticing in, and hearing from you? And you want to create this really rich picture. Sights, smells, sounds, actions, tastes. And this is where we put all the can'ts, what ifs, couldn'ts, shouldn'ts, but we, we set those aside. We acknowledge they're there, but for the moment, we're going to create a vision of when I hold on to even the possibility of hope. And Emily Dickinson says, dwell in possibilities. So the possibility of hope for change in something different. What would that look like? And create a vision for yourself. Once we have that in our mind, now, this is where I burst people's bubble and I say rarely does, rarely does that happen, the miracle day. But a miracle day is made up of miracle moments. And sometimes we lose sight and we forget to look for evidence of the miracle day and the miracle moment. So if the miracle day is, you know what, I got up, I went to the bathroom, and when I went into the bathroom, I didn't look in the mirror and I didn't body check or I didn't jump right onto the scale. Okay. So we want to look for small little moments. Even if you ended up going back to the mirror and or five minutes later you found yourself body checking, in that moment there was something different because you hadn't done it right when you went into the bathroom. Maybe you ate something different. You ended up purging, 
or over exercising, uh, and yet you tried a different food. You went outside your comfort zone. Maybe you faced a fear. That's a that's a miracle moment. If we are looking for evidence of anything, we will find it if we look hard enough, right? It's like we get blinders on. So the challenge is, is to look for the exception. And that's where our vision can come in really handy. That vision of what your miracle day, what your hope would be, okay? Humor, oh, we all need to laugh. Find ways to have laughter and humor in your life. And sometimes we're gonna have to create it through goat videos. I was introduced to the tiny chef recently. Um, because what happens? In our brain, the body doesn't know the difference between even real laughter and fake laughter. So if we start off by even fake laughing, we chemically change our body, the makeup in our body. And when we chemically change the makeup in our body, we're reducing the stress hormones, okay? We can bring our body back online, our brain back online. And when we're in a different place chemically, then emotionally, cognitively, we're able to make some different decisions and feel differently and do differently. Faith, for a lot of people, faith is a big piece of hope. And this isn't necessarily religion, spirituality, prayer might be part of your hope practice. And I'm gonna say hope is a practice. Just like anything, we can um, build the muscle of hope, okay? Through practice and repetition. So prayer might be part of your practice. Meditation. Miracles, we talked about miracles. Miracles really are those miracle moments, those moments of exception, when something happens that we didn't think would happen, we weren't expecting. Symbols. So hope symbols, this is gonna be a real personal one. They might be written, they might be drawn, they might be uh, an anchor that you carry with you. Symbols become a really great cue for us. So when I talk about cue or anchor, I'm talking about that thing that when we see it on the kitchen fridge, or when we go in, put our hand in our pocket, and then we feel that stone. And, we, and to us, the stone represents or is a symbol of being grounded. Or when I see a picture of a dove, that's, if that represents hope to you, or you actually see the word hope written out, then it becomes a cue of, oh, right. Am I practicing hope? Compassion towards others. At Bridgepoint, we talk a lot about compassion, so important. And I'm gonna say compassion towards self as well. As well as accomplishments and stories of hope. Again, as we were talking about earlier in that model, finding those people that inspire you because they've overcome their own obstacles. So, if you're gonna increase your sense of hope, and again, to practice this, what can you do? You can explore hopes of, pa of the past and how they changed and evolved. So when we're checking in with ourselves, sometimes we have hopes that didn't come true, or when we think about them, they're no longer as relevant for us. And they changed over time. So be curious about those. 
we need to accept and honor acknowledging our individuality. So my hope is not going to be your hope. When you are in recovery, your hopes for recovery may not look the same as your loved ones. Recovery is a really personal journey and a personal process. And so what is hopeful to you, what creates hope, what maintains hope, how you practice hope is going to look different for every single person. Another way is increasing sense of control. Now, it's always good to remember, what do we have control over? We've only got control of ourselves. We don't have control over anybody else, their thoughts, emotions, feelings, actions. So if I only have control over myself, how do I increase a sense of control in a way that doesn't hurt me or anybody else? sense of control in where I focus my energy. So focusing on those exceptions, the miracle moments. A uh, sense of control through the practices that I put in place, those structures and systems that I use to remind and cultivate the hope. Often those inspiring stories and those connections, when we see other people believing in us and believing in recovery and people that have overcome, oftentimes they are talking also about the things they did. And so we can, we can get a sense of control after hearing how other people have done it for themselves. Exchanging thoughts and feelings. So again, we've got to we've got to be talking. We've got to be sharing thoughts and feelings with people that have earned the right to hear your story. Pets. Pets are always a great support and a great practice. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you look at at your pet um, or animals that you're living with or working with or have had in your life, they also can be great examples of overcoming adversity, um, learning how to connect, and when you see a dog getting ready to go to the lake or the river, and that hope that they are completely 100% embodying, there's no filter. It's just pure, like, cannot wait. What if, we, what if we tapped into that a little bit? What if we allowed ourselves to have that as well? Emphasize the progress made. Often we can get focused on what's not going well, where um, there were barriers to us maintaining hope or having hope or cultivating hope. Again, those miracle moments, those times when we were able to overcome adversity and see the progress we've made, anytime we're able to see progress, that's a really ho hope-inducing process. Because when we're able to say, hey, I achieved this, I did this, I didn't think I'd be able to. Huh, if I was able to do that, maybe I can do this. It brings more hope. Emphasize other focus. So what is meant here is we can be focusing on others. So focusing outside ourselves and paying attention to others and their process. It can also mean changing our focus from problem-saturated to exception-saturated. 
right? So we're looking for exceptions, we're looking for solutions, um, but emphasizing an other focus. If we've spent our time and our energy focused on one thing, how things aren't gonna happen, how people always betray us, how people always let us down, how my body never does what I want it to do, um, how, um, whatever the story might be, when we focus on something other than that, we're shifting the energy. And when we shift the energy, that's where we're able to make changes. Because we've brought it into the conscious level and we're actively practicing doing something different. Mindfulness, being in the present moment without judgment. Again, we spoke about the importance of humor. Engaging in novel behaviors. So doing something you haven't tried before. Anytime we do something different, that invites hope. That invites that, huh, I hadn't thought about this. It stretches our mind and our body and our brain and our emotions to do different. And when we do different, that invites hope. Affirming spiritual beliefs. Again, we talked about faith and spirituality and the importance of that. And attributing meaning to life. So we, what this is speaking to us is, this, is the, the meaning that we create and we give to events in our life, to our life in general, but even on a smaller scale, what do we, what meaning do we attach to our successes? What meaning do we attach to feelings and actions? And oftentimes those have been influenced by the stories that we've been told, other people tell, we've told ourselves. So get curious about the meanings you attach. Even the meaning you attach to the word hope and the thought of experiencing hope. When we get curious about that, then we are often going to find our stories. And then we have a choice of whether those stories are working for us anymore. Nelson Mandela said, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. Again, this is a practice. And hope is a choice point.